In this video, I'm going to cover radioactive decay and nuclear equations. So radioactivity was first discovered by Becquerel, who found that certain minerals were constantly producing energy, uh, even though they were receiving no input of energy. Um, he determined that all the minerals that produced these rays contained uranium, and the rays were produced even though the mineral was not exposed to any outside energy. So he called them uranic rays, because they were emitted, emitted from uranium, and these were similar to x-rays and uh, not related to phosphorescence, which is another um, uh, phenomenon that involves emitting light, um, visible light, where minerals that uh, are essentially glow in the dark, where some minerals can receive energy from um, an outside source of light, like the sun, for example, and then when you take that mineral into a dark room, it glows, it glows in the dark. Like maybe you've seen those star stickers that you put on your, in, in your room, and uh, they, anything that glows in the dark is actually phosphorescent. Um, and so he determined this was not related to phosphorescence because these were not receiving any outside energy. And phosphorescence requires that in order for something to glow in the dark, it has to get charged up first. So phosphorescence requires outside energy to charge it up, and then it can, and then when the energy is removed, it can release that energy. So these were different than that. Um, and later, of course, uh, Mary Curie is who discovered radioactivity um, by uh, working, uh, extending the work of Becquerel. And she showed that the rays were emitted from uh, elements not just uranium. And um, by measuring these rays and detecting these rays, she discovered new elements, radium and polonium. Uh, and d determined that since th there were different elements besides uranium that were emitting these rays, that she uh, changed the name from uranic rays to radioactivity. So radioactive rays, uh, what radioactivity can do is it can ionize matter. And ionized matter means uh, turning uh, an atom that's neutral into an atom that's an ion. Now there's two different ways to do that. Um, a radioactive ray can remove an electron from a neutral atom, which will cause it to have a positive charge or a radioactive ray can remove a neutron from the nucleus, which would cause the atom to have a negative charge. So radioactive rays can turn neutral atoms into ions by ejecting electrons or protons from the nucleus, and, and they also can eject neutrons from the nucleus. Radioactive rays have high energy, they can penetrate matter, and uh, radioactive rays cause phosphorescent chemicals to, gl to glow. So we can charge glow-in-the-dark stickers with a light bulb, uh, visible, um, visible electromagnetic radiation, or we can charge uh, phosphorescent materials with radioactive rays, which are higher energy electromagnetic radiation. Remember, visible light and x-rays are really the same thing. It's just that visible light has less energy, and, and x-rays are electromagnetic waves with more energy. So what is radioactivity? Well, radioactivity is the release of tiny high-energy particles or rays. So they're either, they're either pieces of matter that are being emitted from uh, an atom, or it's just electromagnetic energy. There's different kinds of radioactive decay. And particles are ejected from the nucleus. So there's different kinds of radioactive decay. Uh, Rutherford discovered three different types of rays. So there were different uh, rays being emitted from these radioactive elements, and so they were put into the group called radioactive elements. But when Rutherford did tests on these uh, radioactive rays, the different rays that were coming out of different elements, he determined that they weren't always the same. So alpha rays are positively charged, are composed of positively charged particles. So they have a positive charge of plus two and a mass of four AMU. So we know that they are particles that carry mass. Um, and we, when we look at alpha rays, we'll uh, see that they're actually just the nuclei of helium atoms. Uh, beta rays have a charge of negative one and negligible mass. They are electron-like. So um, beta rays are basically electrons that have been emitted from an atom, and they uh, are carrying a lot of kinetic energy as they're emitted from the atom, kinetic energy just being the energy of them moving through space.
So uh, these beta rays, being electrons, have a charge of negative one. And remember that an electron's mass is very, very small, but it's still there. So these are particles. Beta, beta rays are composed of particles. They're composed of electrons. And alpha rays are composed of particles. They're composed of helium nuclei. And finally, gamma rays, that's another type of radioactive decay, these have no mass. So these are also rays that are seemingly emitted from uh, minerals or different elements. Um, but gamma rays are just pure electromagnetic energy. So uh, certain types of radioactive decay do not emit particles. They just emit electromagnetic energy like gamma rays or x-rays. Um, and there's also other types of radioactive decay. So some unstable nuclei emit positrons, which is um, uh, antimatter. And we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. And antimatter is um, kind of like just the opposite of an electron. So a positron has the same mass as an electron, but it has the opposite charge. So a positron is like a positively charged electron, and it's uh, a particle of antimatter. Uh, some unstable nuclei will undergo electron capture. So that's another type of radioactive decay, which involves um, the nucleus actually pulling in an electron that's orbiting the nucleus will get pulled into the nucleus and converted to a, a nuclear particle, which will stabilize the nucleus. So here was Rutherford's experiment. He shot alpha particles. Alpha particles were uh, attracted to the negative side. He used to shot beta particles. Beta particles were attracted to the positive side. And he shot gamma particles, which were attracted to neither side. And he could see that since the alpha and beta particles were um, attracted to a different extent, that this was due to their having a different charge. Beta particles having a negative one charge, and alpha particles having a positive two charge. So these different particles, not only do they have different charges, positive and neutral and negative, they also have different penetrating ability. So alpha particles um, do not go very far. They can't penetrate matter very far. They can only penetrate about 0 0.01 millimeters of lead. So what that means is that alpha particles generally get absorbed by the first piece of matter that they hit. They, they interact with most matter. Beta particles can travel through 0 0.01 millimeter lead, uh, but they will get absorbed by one millimeter lead. So beta particles have higher penetrating ability. They are, have higher penetration than alpha particles, um, but they'll still get stuck. So maybe they can travel through a piece of paper, but they'll, they can't travel through a, a two by four or something. They can't travel through a piece of wood. And finally, gamma particles have very high penetrating ability. Gamma particles can travel through um, a point a, a paper, a piece of paper thin um, sheet of lead. They can travel through a half inch piece of lead, and they can even travel through 100 millimeters of lead, which is uh, about six inches. So the number of neutrons in the nucleus is calculated by subtracting the atomic number from the mass number. So remember that inside the nucleus are the protons and the neutrons. And the nucleus of an isotope is called a nuclide. So remember that different elements, although they have the same, um, if we're talking about different atoms of the same element, then they always have the same number of protons. But uh, different atoms of the same element can have different numbers of neutrons. And we call those isotopes. So when we're looking at a certain atom, and we're looking at that atom's nucleus, we call that nucleus a nuclide. So um, we're going to start using some new terms when we're talking about uh, nuclear chemistry in this chapter. S less than 10% of the known nuclides are non-radioactive, and most are radioactive radionuclides. So we'll look at a chart here that shows that there are lots of combinations of protons and neutrons. We can stick zero neutrons in one proton, one neutron in one proton, two neutrons in one proton, three neutrons in one proton, and so on and so on and so on. And there's lots of combinations of protons and neutrons to create different nuclei, but only 10% of them, less than 10%, are stable. More than 90% are unstable. So there's not many combinations of protons and neutrons that actually lead to a stable atom. Most combinations lead to unstable atoms, and unstable atoms 
are radioactive. They're going to emit some kind of radioactivity. Each nuclide is identified by a symbol. So um, we've seen this kind of uh, notation before. X is the chemical symbol. A is the mass number, which is um, protons plus neutrons. And Z is the atomic number, which is just protons. So radioactive nuclei spontaneously decompose into smaller nuclei because they're unstable. So when I have an unstable nucleus, which is caused by the wrong number of protons and neutrons, somehow that number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus is unstable. And when it's unstable, the way that it fixes itself, the way that it becomes more stable, is to spontaneously decompose into smaller nuclei. We call that radioactive decay. So um, when generally, uh, when a radioactive nucleus uh, undergoes radioactive decay, it will become stable. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes one radioactive nucleus decays into a different radioactive nucleus, and then that one decays into a different radioactive nucleus, and so on and so on. The parent nuclide is the nucleus that is undergoing radioactive decay, and the daughter nuclide is the new nucleus that is made. All nuclides with 84 or more protons are radioactive. So here's one way in which we can make a combination of protons and neutrons unstable. All nuclides, all nuclei that have 84 or more protons are radioactive, regardless of how many neutrons they have. If they have 84 or more, they're all radioactive. So um, again, most of, the, most of the combinations of protons and neutrons, most of the different nuclei that we can look at are unstable combinations. In fact, all of them above atomic number 84 are unstable. So when we're, when we're looking at these nuclear transitions where one element, one unstable nucleus falls apart into smaller pieces, we're going to have to look at some new symbols to create these equations, these nuclear equations. So we'll um, symbolize a proton as P plus. And remember, when we're talking about a proton, we're really just talking about uh, an H nucleus that doesn't have an electron. Because remember, hydrogen, the simplest atom, only has one proton and zero neutrons in its most stable isotope. So here's one way we can represent a proton, P plus, uh, lowercase p. And here's a way that we can represent this with a nuclear symbol. So the mass of P of a proton is 1. And down here, this is the charge. The charge of P is plus 1. It has a, a positive 1 charge. It weighs 1, and it has a plus 1 charge. Remember that we um, define the mass of a proton and a neutron as being equal to 1 amu. So when we say that a proton has a mass of 1, that's what we're, we're referring to, 1 amu. And down here is a plus 1 charge. A neutron has a symbol lowercase n, 0. And here's another way we represent it, lowercase n. A neutron has the same mass as a proton, 1 amu. They, have this, they weigh the same. But a neutron is neutral, so its charge is 0. But the proton has a positive charge, so its charge is plus 1. And an electron we represent as e minus. We've seen this before. And um, an electron, another way, a nuclear symbol, um, when we're writing nuclear equations, we're going to use these symbols over here. Uh, the electron has zero mass. Remember, an electron weighs so much less than a proton and a neutron that we consider it to have zero mass. And it has a negative one charge. So here are the ways that we represent protons, neutrons, and electrons in radioactive, in nuclear uh, equations. We talked about an alpha particle as being a type of radioactivity. So here's how we represent alpha particles. An alpha particle is composed of two protons and two neutrons. So 2 plus 2 means that it has four particles that have mass, protons and neutrons, so it weighs 4 amu. And its charge is plus 2. And if something has four, it has two protons and two neutrons, and it has a plus 2 charge, we call that an alpha particle. And remember, this symbol here is uh, the lowercase alpha. This is a Greek symbol. Uh, beta. Beta particles are like electrons that are ejected and they have high kinetic energy. They're moving very quickly after they're ejected from the nucleus. Um, and beta particles are represented with this symbol, this uppercase beta. It's kind of like a B, uh, or B beta minus. And here are their nuclear symbols. Remember, being that a beta particle is essentially an electron that's moving really fast, 
it has the same symbol as an electron. We can even symbolize a beta particle as being an electron. It's just an electron that has a high kinetic energy, whereas an electron that's orbiting a nucleus does not have a high kinetic energy. It's not moving quickly. Um, and finally, a positron. Remember we said a positron was um, like the opposite of an electron, and we call that antimatter. And so since it's the opposite of the electron, it has the same charge, excuse me, it has the same mass as an electron, zero, but it has the opposite charge. An electron is negative one, and a positron is positive one. And so even though it's a positron, we don't put a P here, because that's the symbol for proton. A, posit a positron being like an opposite electron is still going to have the symbol of an E. It just has a plus one charge instead of a minus one charge. Um, or we could use the beta symbols too. Beta negative is an electron, a beta particle. Beta positive is a positron, a, a particle of antimatter. Um, so when an unstable nucleus falls apart into smaller pieces, that means that it's generally losing uh, a beta particle, or a which will it's not uh, when an element releases a beta particle, it's not losing an electron from an electron that's orbiting the nucleus. Somehow an electron is being ejected from the nucleus of an atom. And that's weird because you'd say there aren't electrons in the nucleus of the atom, but we'll get there in a minute. But every time we're losing some uh, radioactive particle from an unstable nucleus, it involves losing um, or changing the number of protons and neutrons. So the number, every time we have an, a nuclear reaction, we're changing the number of protons and neutrons. So if we're changing the number of protons in a nuclear reaction, that means we're turning one element into another element. So this is something we've been saying from the beginning, that we can't turn elements into other elements. Remember, that was something that the alchemists tried to do. They wanted to turn lead into gold, and we eventually determined, well, elements are stable, and you can't turn one element into another. Well, it turns out that's wrong, and it's a natural occurrence for elements to turn in, for one element to turn into another element. And if that element is unstable and it's radioactive, when it becomes more stable, it has become a different element. It doesn't just release energy and be, and be the same element, but a more stable version of the same element. It becomes a new element that's more stable. We call that transmutation. So again, for one element to change into another, that means that the, during this radioactive decay, the number of protons in the nucleus is changing. Everything we've been talking about up to this point now has been a chemical reaction, a chemical process. And we've looked at atoms before, and we've looked at chemical reactions before, and we've talked about kinetics, and we've talked about thermodynamics. And every time we're thinking about um, all the chemical reactions and their thermodynamic values and how fast they go, and everything that we've looked at up to this point, chemical reactions only involve changing electrons. And think about that because when we draw a chemical reaction, like the, uh, redox reactions are a perfect example of that. In a redox reaction, electrons are moving from one thing to another thing, right? Something is being oxidized and something is being reduced. It's the electrons that are moving. When I'm breaking bonds, what are bonds made of? They're made of electrons. So in most chemical reactions, I'm breaking bonds and making bonds. So I'm breaking bonds that are made of electrons and I'm making new bonds that are made of those same electrons. So chemical reactions really just involve change the electrons changing positions. That's all chemical reactions are, moving electrons around. But nuclear reactions, everything we're going to look at in this chapter, nuclear reactions actually involve changing the nucleus. N chemical reactions never do. We're only moving electrons around. But in nuclear reactions, we're, there's always changes occurring in the nucleus. Sometimes changes occurring to the electrons too, but we're focused on the changes that are occurring in the nucleus when we look at nuclear reactions. And so whereas chemical reactions are focused solely on changes in electrons, nuclear reactions are generally focused on changes in protons and neutrons, the particles that are in the nucleus.
So again, this radioactive decay, we describe these processes with nuclear equations. And you can see down here, a nuclear equation is very similar to a chemical equation in that it has reactants, so sometimes one, sometimes two, and an arrow that shows that those reactants are changing. And it has products, sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes more. So reactants on the left, products on the right. One thing turning into another thing. Um, but it's not electrons that are changing now. It's nuclear particles, protons and neutrons, that are changing. So instead of calling them reactants on the left, we call them parent nuclides. And instead of calling them products on the right, we call them daughter nuclides. So the parent is what comes first, and the daughter is what it turns into. So when we're looking at nuclear equations, we can see that they're balancing a nuclear equation is actually pretty easy. Atomic numbers and mass numbers are conserved. So on this side, I have 2, 38, and 92. That means that on this side, the numbers on the top have to equal 238, and the numbers on the bottom down here have to equal 92. These numbers must be conserved because mass is conserved in every reaction. If the mass doesn't disappear, and I don't create new mass, it just transforms. So 238 on top, 234 plus 4. 92 on the bottom, 90 plus 2.